Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to chapel today. Today's an exciting day in the life of our campus as today is our spring trustee meeting. It's always a blessing to have our trustees with us. So if you're here and you're a trustee or a guest of a trustee, would you stand and let us give you a Clear Creek welcome this morning? For both our on-campus and our online students, I hope that the presence of the trustees being here is an encouragement to you. It should be a reminder that uh, we're not on this journey alone because these folks love you and uh, they, they serve the Board of Trustees as a result of both the love for you as a student and a love for this institution and what we do. So I want to say from uh, the bottom of my heart uh, with all sincerity how thankful I am that these individuals give of their time. Um, all of them have busy schedules, and they could be other places, but they've, they've chosen because they believe God has called them to serve this institution in that role. And I want the trustees to hear me say how important it is and how vital it is, their participation, more importantly, their partnership in all ways to help us accomplish what God has set before us. And today being a trustee chapel, we have a, a trustee that's going to preach for us, my friend, Brother Mark Payton. Brother Mark has uh, many distinctions that make him unique. He has varied experience, both uh, pastoring and uh, serving as an AMS, and, and probably the only one in history that's ever co-pastored with Lincoln Bingham. But uh, Brother Mark has been at Bedford Baptist Church for the last five years and uh, been a longtime trustee, served multiple terms for us. He's been a trustee at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary as well. He's a great pastor, a great preacher, and a great friend of this institution. So, Brother Mark, thank you so much for your willingness to come and uh, open the word of life for us today. Let's pray together as we open our service and the worship team will come. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being gathered in this place. We thank you for this place that you've created called Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. Lord, we thank you for calling us here, whether it be student, staff, faculty, or trustee, or Lord, just a guest that's here with us today. Father, we pray that your blessings would be upon our time together. Lord, I pray for the trustee meetings. I pray that uh, I thank you for those who've all, that have already transpired, for those that will transpire this afternoon. We pray your richest and deepest blessings upon them. But Lord, now as we come to this time to worship you, Lord, I pray that, that any worry, concern, or trepidation regarding a meeting, Lord, I, I pray that that would dissipate. Father, I pray it would be replaced with a sense of awe for you. May we worship you now in spirit and truth. And Lord, may you anoint your preacher. May you anoint Brother Mark. Lord, uh, just uh, speak through him and speak to us. And Lord, I pray you speak to me as an individual. Do a work in this place and in our lives we pray. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, Clear Creek family, good to have you all back with us today. Let's stand together and worship our Savior. Oh, oh, oh. 
Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love untold and come behold the wondrous mystery slain by death the god of life but no grave could e'er restrain him praise the lord he is alive what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope in power resurrected as we will be when he comes be thou my vision O Lord of my heart not be all else to me Please, Lord. 
Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we get ready to enter into this time of worship through special music, we're going to sing a song that's called, There is One Gospel, or nothing, excuse me, nothing but the blood applied, Lord Jesus. And God, during this song, we just celebrated Easter, and God, I pray that we didn't just pass over Easter, Lord, thinking that, okay, that's all well and good. We know statistically it's been shown that the Sunday after Easter is one of the hardest Easter's, God, to, or Sunday's, God, that we have to witness to people. And God, I just pray this morning, whatever distractions may be on our heart, whether it be, will we have that many people in attendance? Did anyone come to know you as Savior this past week? Will we see a fruit this week? God, we may worry about all these things, but ultimately, it's your Holy Spirit and your power that does it all. We are your vessels. And so, God, when we sing this song in just a moment, we are going to declare that it is your blood that has been applied to us on Calvary. And, Lord, as we thank you for that blood, help us use it to empower us and to strengthen us to do what you've called us to do. The trustees are here today, Lord, seeking out your will for this institution. God, I pray they remember that they can't do it, we can't do it in our own strength. But it's nothing but the blood. And, Lord, I pray right now, that we view the cross, we view that empty tomb, Lord, with such vigor and such encouragement that it fuels us to do what you've called us to do. And so, God, as we enter in this time of continued worship, I ask your hand of blessing upon us. Bless this song, Lord Jesus, and let it impact us, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray this. Amen.
Father God, we do just thank you for your blood. Lord, thank you. Lord, without you, God, we are nothing. Lord, we thank you for resurrecting. That is our hope. Lord, thank you. Lord, that's all I can say is thank you. Lord, and I pray for the speaker that comes. Lord, loose his tongue, Father God. Lord, speak through him. Lord, let it not be himself but you. And we'll be quick to give you all the praise and glory. Thank you. Well, amen. Thank you, students. One of the highlights for me as I come to the trustee meetings is to hear you all lead us in worship. Thank you all so much. Um, I've been excited about uh, Dr. Goodman's leadership and what he has done thus far until I got a call and he wanted me to be one of the first trustees to preach at chapel for him. Uh, so I begin to question his leadership from that point on. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, it's a privilege and it's a joy to be here. I was sitting at the, uh, uh, I guess it was the REACH conference uh, this year in uh, E-Town. As I was sitting there, one of the preachers, he was a substitute. Uh, somebody could not make it. I think it was Jay Strack that could not make it. And so they had a pastor from Louisville preach. And he used this passage of scripture that I'm going to start with. But it immediately, as he mentioned that, it took my mind to another sermon that I had. And I want to connect those two this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to talk to you for a few moments on don't forget the cause. Don't forget the cause. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 and 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, these two stories remind us, first of all, 1 Samuel 17 reminds us of David and Goliath. 2 Samuel 11 we think about David and Bathsheba, but I want to connect David and Uriah and uh, think about the fact of don't forget the cause. We stand in honor of reading of God's Word. 1 Samuel 17, verse 28 and 29. And Elab, his eldest brother, Heard when he sp heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, "Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thy heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle." And David said. What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Now let's jump approximately 40 years to 2 Samuel 11. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down into his house, David said unto Uriah, Causest, uh, or, or comest thou not from the journey? Why then doest thou not go down unto thy house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark, Israel, and Judah, Abide in the tents, and my lord Joab, and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go into my house to eat, drink, and, and to lie down with my wife, as thou so livest, and as, as, as thou livest, and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also and tomorrow. And I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at the evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but went not down to his house. Let's pray together. Father, these next few moments... As we take these two stories, may we not forget the cause. 
May we not forget as Uriah literally gave David five causes of why he's got to stay in the fight for the cause. God, help us this morning to understand this. And Father, also help us to stay in the fight, to remember the cause and a battle that is before us in the society that we live in. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As I think about uh, you as students this morning, ask yourself a question where you might be 40 years from now. And I'm not necessarily talking about what position, what church you might be in, but about your spiritual condition. Let me f give you a quick background of these two passages of Scripture. In 1 Samuel uh, 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 chapter 17, David's brothers are in battle with the Philistines. Jesse tells David uh, to leave his sheep and, and, and to go the next day and, and to find out how his brothers are doing and to take them some lunch. Now, I find that very interesting, first of all, that in, in, that, in that battle on that day, you could just go out and deliver a meal to your brothers. <laughs> and David did. And while he's there, uh, Goliath sort of shows up, and David wants to know who this is, and, and he finds, really, Israel hiding because they are afraid to death of Goliath. And I could hear sort of the conversation, and David uh, said, who is this guy, and so forth, and they go on and share with him how he's Goliath, and so forth, and, and, and David says, uh, What's the war for somebody who defeats this giant? And I hear his brother sort of say, hey, you go on back home, we'll handle it. And David says, don't look like you're doing a good job to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so in this, his brother simply says, you're here because of your naughtiness and you're here because your heart isn't where it ought to be. And David said, is there not a cause? Now let's jump 40 years, 40, 45 years it is a time when kings were to go out to battle. And David stays home, takes him a nap, gets up on the rooftop and he sees Bathsheba. My simple point is simply this. David was probably in 1 Samuel 17, somewhere between 15 and 20 years of age. And at that point he was hot. He says, isn't there a cause? But some 40 years later, he's forgot the cause. And now he isn't at battle. He isn't where he ought to be. And he does nothing more as he has an affair with Bathsheba. She comes back and admits that she is pregnant. And then David does nothing more than have a government cover-up to try to kill Uriah. And Uriah, huh, the Hittite, <laughs> had more character than David ever intended for him to have. <laughs> Uriah had more, uh, the more, more insight into what God was doing. So my question to not just the students that are here, but my question to all of us, let's not forget the calls. Even 40 years down the road, and I'm going to give you some statistics in just a moment. David, however, he did not take into consideration how strong and how godly Uriah was. You see, folks, Uriah married a beautiful young uh, uh, Jewish girl named Bathsheba. He joined the army. He immediately went up in ranks. And if I understand the story correctly, he lived in the same housing development that the king did for the king to see his, his uh, uh, Bathsheba bathing. He had moved up in the ranks. Uh, uh, as you read this story, you understand it. He, his conversation experience was just, uh, his, or his conversion experience was just a life-changing experience for him. He, 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 he left uh, the gods that he worshipped uh, to follow the God of Abraham and Isaac and uh, Jacob. And he had a cause. David says wanted him to go to his house and no more. David, in essence, the bottom line, David wanted to send him home so he could have a sexual relationship with his wife and then blame the pregnancy on him. 
And Uriah said, as you live and as my soul lives, I will not do this thing. He said, David, you want to call me back from battle. There is a war going on. I cannot do this thing. I got to stay in the fight for the cause. I thank God for, the, for uh, a man who would be willing to take that stand. Listen to me, folks. I don't know if you realize it or not, but we are, rage, we are in a war that is raging in America. Like never before. Satan is on the tack like he has never been. I think, you know, I hear people sometimes talk about, well, he knows his time is short. I, I, I don't know if he really knows it or not, but I, he just knows he's out to destroy lives and he's out seeking and roaming whom he can devour. And in this particular instant, 40 years later, he got David. So let's think about it for a moment. You see, as believing of Christians, we are in a fight for our lives. Casualties are mounting as we fail to, to even reproduce ourselves among our own children. Even in that, you think about it, folks are they're quitting on God. They're an apathy like I've never been before. We are in a mess in America like never before. We need to get back to the cause. May I remind us that, that even, you know, we talk about pastors, we talk about ministry, but folks, we still need godly men and women that are willing to teach their kids what Scripture says and to teach young girls to be young girls and to teach young men to be young men. And if you ever try to do anything other than what God has created you to be, I'll knock a ward on your head. Hello? We live in a tire. We, we just live in a mess. You know, when I was uh, 10 years old, I was still passing out cooties. <laughs> huh? A matter of fact, I passed them out and received them so much, I forgot whether I still got them or not. But we live in a total different society. And as David has forgotten the cause, Uriah reminds him, Uriah gives him five reasons why he's not going to forget the cause. He gives him five reasons why, David, I'm not going to do this thing. I want to stay hot on the cause for God. So let's look at these five things real quickly. Number one, he says our faith is under attack. You see, when you realize that your faith is under attack, you'll return to the cause. Uriah says the ark is out there. Now, the ark represented God, if you please. It was a symbol. But not only was it, a, not only to remind them as a symbol of God, it was a place where God abode at that time. And it wasn't uncommon that when they went to battle, they took the ark with them. And so what Uriah is simply saying to David, as you live as my soul lives, I cannot do this thing. I cannot go home. I cannot leave the battle because my faith is under attack out there. Folks, our faith is under attack like it has never been before. The government is after our churches. Hollywood is after our kids. The sodomites are after the pure lifestyle of our country. The media is saying and making us look like idiots. Our faith is under attack. Humanism is trying to seal the very heart and the soul of American. Evolutionists are trying to, to uh, rob God of the creation. And since the world and the devil are attacking our faith, it's not time to retreat. It's time to stay for the cause. Our faith under attack. But folks, I'm coming, you know, not only is it under attack from the ungodly, many times our faith is under attack from the inside. I wonder, I don't know how it is in your area, but I really want, you know, I, I personally have a problem. I, uh, somebody asked me, preacher, what would you be if you wasn't a Baptist? I'd be ashamed. 
Huh? <laughs> and yet we have kids that was raised in the Baptist churches that's leaving for every other denomination under the earth. We're losing this very battle. Our faith is not only attacked from the outside, it's being attacked from our very churches. I had a gentleman a few years ago as we went through the uh, COVID incident and he had quit coming to church, so forth, so on. And, and uh, everybody report to him things that he knew, that they knew I said that he didn't like. So he came to a meeting one time with his notepad and he just had all kinds of questions for me. We're under attack. I pastored a church once and, and, and I had met with the deacon's body to share what scripture said and this is the honest truth. One of the deacons pushed that Bible across from me and says, we don't care what that says. Our faith's under attack. But notice, not only is our faith under attack, Uriah also says our nation is under attack. The ark is out there and Israel is out there. What was he talking about? He's simply saying our nation is under attack. And the truth of the matter is, folks, when you think about the nation of Israel, it will be under attack until the Lord comes back. Everybody has tried to destroy her. And don't let anybody lie to you. God's not finished with the nation of Israel. And one of the reasons God has blessed America the way she has, because America has been a friend to the nation of Israel. And when that ceases, look out. Uriah says, as my soul liveth, I can't go out there because Israel is under attack. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you America is under attack. It is under attack by politicians who we vote to send in office. It's under attack by others. Let me just remind you of some things. Again, think about where are you going to be 40 years from now. Isn't there a cause? 20 years ago, it was illegal to burn a flag. 25 years ago or plus, the Sodomites were not in office, and if they were, they were quiet about it. 25 years ago, we valued human life. And almost, what, 50-some years ago or whatever, abortion was illegal. And by the way, the Supreme Court did not change the law on abortion. They just passed it down to the states. And many states are saying, well, it's, the only reason we're going to allow it now is because of incest and rape. Well, let me give you a question to think about. When under heaven has incest and rape give us a right to murder? Hello? When has it given us the right to murder? Only eternity would tell how many mothers have had babies out of wedlock and rape that God has used for eternity. Our nation is under attack. 25 years ago, the youth of America had values. But I remember growing up as a, as a kid, we used to fight with, with our neighbors over what issue, and the next five minutes we was out playing football or basketball. We didn't run home and get a gun. <laughs> our nation's under attack. 25 years ago, uh, uh, one judge said uh, as he retired, he said that uh, 30 years ago, the juveniles that he put in jail was truce breakers. And now they're murderers. Uriah says, I can't forget the cause. David, you may have forgotten over the years, but I cannot forget the cause because my face under attack and my nation is under attack. Number three, our families are under attack. Do you notice what he says? <laughs> Uriah said the ark is out there, the nation is out there, and Judah is out there. Uriah was a Hittite. He married a Jewish girl. And if you look on down in the passage, it reminds us that her family came from Judah. And Uriah is saying, David, 
There's a cause. My brother-in-laws are out there. My cousins are out there. My family is out there. I got to stay in the fight for the cause because my family is out there. <laughs> David, you have just called me back to battle. I've got to go back to the fight. His family was under attack. Listen, I cannot understand for the life of me why God's people will leave the cause of serving the almighty God who has redeemed us, leave the cause of fighting the good fight of faith for some sin in our lives. Our family is out there. And you know, I love my wife. I love my three children. But I really wonder in five to ten years what this nation is going to be like for my grandchildren as they grow up. What will it be like as they grow up? Think about <laughs> what's on TV today. You cannot watch a primetime show without the homosexual agenda being thrown in our face. You can't even watch a commercial nowadays without it being thrown in our face. Our families are under attack. You know, this new evangelism says, as the world sees the church weakened, your family and mine might suffer persecution because of it. Let me give you a few statistics. The, these are a few years old, but they probably haven't changed. Suicide. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. Behavior disorder. 85% of all children that exhibit behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. High school dropouts. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. The juvenile delinquent detention rates. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions come from childless home or fatherless homes. The criminal activity. The likelihood that a young male will engage in criminal activities dis, uh, that doubles if he is raised without a father. Oh, tell me fathers don't matter in the homes. Well, let's think about our daughters. 53% are more likely to marry as teenagers. 111% are more likely to have children as teenagers. 164% are more likely to have out-of-wedlock birth. Our families are under attack. Uriah says, David, I can't forget the cause because our family is under attack. Well, notice he says, not only is the ark out there, not only is Israel out there, not only is, is Judah out there, but notice what else he says. Our leader is out there. Joab is out there. Joab was his leader. And I say to you, our leaders in America is under attack. Our leaders in our own convention has been under attack. Ain't it amazing? And as I talk about our, 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 our leaders politically, and I'm not going to get into that, I just want to talk about our pastors being under attack. Our spiritual leaders are under attack. Like never before, they tell us that an estimated 1,700 pastors, and this just ain't in a convention, it's across the nation, 1,700 pastors leave each month the ministry. And they estimate out of that, 1,300 has had some type of moral affair. Folks, our leaders are under attack. Satan is seeking whom he may devour. Now, let me think about that a little bit more. Let me give you a few statistics on the emotional help and health of a pastor in the ministry. 
70% of pastors say they have lower self-esteem now than when they entered the ministry. 70% constantly fight depression. 50% feel so discouraged that they will leave their ministry if they could, but they're afraid they can't find another job. 80% believe their pastoral ministry has negative effect on their families. God help us. I've been in the pastorate for 40 years. Don't let my gray hair fool you. <laughs> 40 years. Me and my wife has always made it a policy at the dinner table. We don't discuss what's going on in the church. Look at a few more statistics. 80% of ministry spouses feel they are left out and unappreciated in their church. 77% feel they do not have a good marriage. 41 display anger problems in a marriage reported by their spouses. 38% are divorced or divorcing. And 50% admit using pornography and 37% uh, uh, report inappropriate sexual behavior with someone in the church. That's why I'm asking you, where are you going to be 40 years from now? Nail it down right now that you're not going to forget the cause as David did. Well, a few more statistics and we'll move on. The ministry stress alone does not explain why pastors burn out emotionally or blow up morally. Here's a few other statistics. 53% of pastors do not feel the seminary or Bible college prepared them adequately. 70% do not have someone that they consider a close friend. 50% do not meet regularly with an accountability person or group. And those friends of mine that has committed moral failures in the ministry, every one of them did not have an accountability group. Every one of them. 72% only study the Bible when preparing for a sermon. 21% spend less than 15 minutes a day in prayer. 16% are satisfied with their prayer life. 47% are somewhat satisfied. 37% are somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. 47% of pastors do not take a regular day off. Our families are under attack. Our leaders are under attack. Finally, don't get excited about that. Y'all went to sleep on me. You know, David said finally, or Paul said finally, and wrote three more chapters. Hello? Hello? Our fellow Christians are under attack. Joab says the ark is out there, our face under attack. Israel's out there, our nation's under attack. Joab's out there, our leaders are under attack. Uh, Job is out there, our Joab. And then he not notice he says, the servants of our God are out there. The Christians, our fellow Christians are under attack. You know the sad thing about it? It is only in the church that most people come in putting on a disguise. You hear me? We ask people, how you doing? And we smile on their wood, doing great. And for the most part, most of them hurting so bad on the inside. And if there's any place we ought to be honest and we should be honest with other people is in the house of God. I'm hurting today. And the problem is we don't take time out for those hurts because our program's already set. 
your Sunday school class. We don't take time out. Hey, hey, how long has it been in your own Sunday school class that a member came in hurting and you just threw that book aside and said, let's minister to them? We just don't do that. We have our agenda. Isaiah 5 verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You see, folks, the truth is we have always been a minority. <laughs> we always will be. Did you notice what Uriah said? He said, they encamp in an open field. I don't know if you realize it or not. We stand in an open field of immorality. Television shoots like a machine gun. Christians say it's oh harmless. Let me remind, let me just encourage us or something because some of us older ones are probably guilty of it. We would not dare. Let somebody come in our home, strip naked down, cuss like a sailor. If they came in our home and did that, we throw them out, but we won't change the channel. Huh? Christians are under attack. And one of the very ways that Satan will eat you up like a roaring lion is when they call and tell you, we'll give you HBO and, and all this other stuff free for three months. And you get it, and immediately you're caught into it. Well, we're standing in an open field. Let me remind us, our young ladies stand in an unprotected, in an open field or promiscuity. They are mowed down with the lie, everyone is doing it. A while back, New Week magazines ran an article called Twins. And in that article, he's talking about the way that 9, 10, and 11-year-old girls have to dress to get a boyfriend. 9, 10, and 11-year-olds. And may I say it loudly? That ain't a teenager and that ain't a kid's problem. That's a parent problem. We're standing in an open field. Our elementary children innocently stand in an open field of humanism and anti-God and Bible teaching. It comes at them so fast, anti-Bible teaching. They don't even know what hit them. It's time to remember the cause because our face under attack, our nation's under attack, our leaders are under attack. Our family's under attack. And our fellow Christian is under attack. Let me close. Some of us remember the old song, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I trust that you will decide now to stay in the cause and stay on the battlefield. I don't know who wrote this, but I'm going to close with it. Church, it's time we rise up. No more plain acting aloud. No more hypocrisy. No more sitting on the sideline. No more middle of the road. Lukewarm Christianity. We must declare, I will do more than belong, I will participate. I will do more than care, I will help. I will do more than believe, I will practice. I will do more than be fair, I will be kind. I will do more than forgive, I'll forget. I will do more than dream, I will work. I will do more than teach, I will inspire. I will do more than, than earn, I will enrich. I will do more than give, I will serve. I will do more than live, I will I will grow. I will do more than suffer. I will triumph for the cause of Christ. Amen. Don't forget the cause. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for a man like Uriah that stood faithful. When his king 
wanted him to be unfaithful. God, help us that wherever we're at in our ministries, that we don't forget the cause. And the cause is to get the gospel message to people that are hurting and give them the story of hope that only comes through the person of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we ask it. Amen.